VO2 max is so important. The data are unambiguous. Improve your VO2 max. But I'd be remiss to not remind you about how important VO2 max is. I'm in my 30s and since the beginning of the year, I've taken my VO2 max from around average to the top 1% of the population. And in this video, I'm gonna to explain to you what VO2 max is, why all the top health experts are talking about it, and how I massively improve mine with some simple steps. If you're new here, welcome to the channel. My name's Adam, I'm a health and fitness coach with a keen interest in optimizing human performance, an area that I currently research at a doctorate level. So what the hell is VO2 max and why do we always hear about it? VO2 max quite literally means the volume of maximum oxygen and a measure of how much oxygen your body uses during really intense exercise. Essentially, it's how powerful your engine is, how fast and how long it can go for. And it's the number one predictor of health span and longevity because VO2 max is reflective of how efficient your heart, your lungs and your muscles all are, which are crucial for health. Lifespan essentially means the time between when you're born and death, you probably already know that, but health span or longevity is a shorter period of time where you're living disability free and disease free. For example, if you live to 85, but you suffer with chronic conditions for 20 years, then your health span is only 65. It's not really a black or white situation or hard line in the sand, it's just about living a good quality of life. So even if you don't care about being a better athlete or you hate doing cardio, everybody is limited by their VO2 max. For most of my life, I personally hated cardio, at least most forms of it. I played basketball at a pretty high level until I was about 20, but then I completely stopped to focus on bodybuilding. And for basically all of my 20s, the only form of cardio I did was doing sets of 12 or more on the squat. In fact, for the first period of my 20s, when I studied in France, the only time my heart rate would ever peak was when I was drinking vodka straight from the bottle. I really only saw cardio as a tool for fat loss, a way to burn calories, and I can't stress how much I didn't like it. In fact, before last year, I had only ever ran more than seven kilometers once, and that was when I did an adventure race when I was 18. I'm now in my 30s. And I honestly didn't feel like I needed it. I was a very good natural bodybuilder. I got very close to my goal of becoming a professional natural bodybuilder. And the only cardio I did was increasing my steps before competitions in order to burn calories. But then I hit my 30s, my dad passed away after a short illness, I personally started to get some chest pains, and I realized that I had super high blood pressure and I just got a real sense of my own mortality. I needed to get loads of these tests done and scans to figure out what the issue was, and I just realized that I'm not gonna live forever, and I'm not getting any younger. Around that same time, I was in Rome, Italy for the first time ever, and we had bought tickets to go to the Colosseum, but I forgot my ID, so I rushed back to the hotel so we could make the entry in time. But as soon as we entered the gates, my blood sugar completely crashed because I was so unfit, I had rushed to get the ID, and I immediately had to leave so that I could get something sweet in order to stop the cold sweats. To this day, I still haven't seen the inside of the Colosseum, and that was another pivotal point. Five foot 10, 220 pounds, very strong, a good natural bodybuilder, but also a very delusional. Now, I didn't really take any action until last year when I got the opportunity to do my first 10K race with my friend, essentially the first intentional run that I did in over a decade. It took me 56 minutes to complete, not terrible, but certainly not great by any standards. And that was the start of my journey into intentional cardio for reasons other than fat loss. I didn't really do much after that, a run here or there, and just signed up for my second race later in the same year, which was another 10K, but this time I finished around the 50 minute mark. I liked the idea of the progression that I made, and at that point I really set out to improve my times by actually having a plan. This was just the end of last year. So I didn't intentionally set out to just improve my VO2 max for the sake of it, but rather my fitness or my running times, which of course are basically the same thing or are very closely linked. And I think this is just the first key point. I did something that I actually enjoy doing and progressing towards. I know so many people who hate doing cardio, especially when it comes to trying to lose fat. I really looked forward to going out there and getting a run, progressing, working towards something. And you know what? I think I probably could have progressed faster if I went on the rower in the gym and got some rowing in and probably would have got my VO2 max number higher quicker, but I wouldn't have enjoyed it and I wouldn't have stuck to it long enough to actualize the results. So how did I measure my starting point? Well, I did what a lot of people do when they start something new. I spent loads of money on buying all the gear and I got this Garmin Phoenix 7X watch, which was quite expensive. But a side benefit of this was that after about a week, this Garmin gave me a VO2 max score number. It was calculated from heart rate and paces, etc. It's not 100% accurate, but according to YouTube and other videos that I've watched, it's fairly close. Now my starting number was 43, which is right around average for my age of 32 years old. If you don't have a watch 
or you want a more accurate reading, then you can get a VO2 max test in a lab, or you can simply do the beep test and estimate your number that way. I've made a free mini course in the description that will explain this in more detail. You can check it out below this video. And it was from this starting number that I was able to increase my VO2 max by about 40%, when in the literature, we typically only see increases of about five to 20%. So how did I do that? How did I defy science or did I defy science? Well, not really. You see, in research, the studies are typically only a few months long. They often contain trained athletes with already really high starting numbers and they only control one variable, training. Now, this isn't a flaw with science. In fact, you want to control as much variables as possible so that you can pinpoint specific effects from specific interventions. For me, I threw the kitchen sink at it. I wanted to optimize everything within reason. I do have a pretty busy lifestyle out of exercise, but I wanted to focus on doing as much as I possibly could. I changed my training, my nutrition, my supplementation, and even my body weight. At this point, I also hired a running coach to create a plan. It's always been my philosophy to pay others who are ahead of me in a certain area, and it's always paid off pretty well. Some people pay with their time, others pay with their money. I'm very impatient. So the form of cardio obviously that I chose was running. It's easily accessible. Any bike that I ever had has always been stolen. I don't like swimming in the sea and that you can't go skiing in Ireland. And at this point, I just started to have some structure, an actual plan. My running went from about five to 10 inconsistent kilometers per week, which was usually just a park run at the weekend, to about 20 kilometers per week, which was split up into three runs. An easy run at a conversational pace for about 30 minutes, a workout run, which was typically intervals or faster paces, and then a long run at the weekend, which was typically just a little bit faster than that easy run. And it was slow. I mean, if I really wanted to, I probably could have power walked both the easy run and the long run. But I also made one rookie error at this point. I kept my weightlifting exactly the same. Four days in the gym and just slapped the running on top. And I ended up getting pretty sick pretty fast. Within four to six weeks, I was sick and I wasn't able to train at all. I couldn't get hold of the coach that I was working with at the time who made the plan and that was kind of the end of that. Being a coach myself, I have kind of pretty high standards and they just weren't met. So I decided, you know what, I'm gonna do this alone. I already knew the basics, but I wanted to become an expert. I read tons of books and articles, listened to hundreds of hours of podcasts and YouTube videos. And it was around this time when I got my first official VO2 max test in a lab. Well, technically it was in a gym. My score according to the official test was 51, but on the Garmin it was 49. Nonetheless, still a six point improvement from that starting point of 43. And that put me in the top 20% for VO2 max for my age. So at this point, I was about three months into a structured plan. From the time of sickness, my training hadn't really changed that much, but I was probably only lifting two times per week. Sometimes I do a little bit more just depending on how I really felt. If you had told me two years ago that I'd be only lifting weights twice per week, I'd be honestly shocked because for over a decade, I identified so much as being a bodybuilder. From here, I kept the plan very similar to what the initial coach had given me. I just tweaked it ever so slightly based on some of my learnings and feedback. The weekly mileage was basically the same, around 20 kilometers total across three runs, but I was inconsistent. Sometimes I would skip a run to play a pickup basketball game, for example. I did add more structure then to the weightlifting. I changed it from a truncated four day split, which was upper lower to more of a three day full body split. I focused more on single leg movements and core. I also backed off things like heavy squats and heavy deadlifts. I just wasn't able to continue to train like a bodybuilder and improve my running at the rate that I wanted to. Plus I already had way more strength than I needed to, to be a good runner. As I said before, you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. And at this particular time, getting as fast and as fit as possible was the most important thing to me. Now, all along this time, my VO2 max number was slowly increasing on the Garmin by one point every couple of weeks or so. But I started to stagnate again. And although I just feel like the runs were getting easier, progress slowed down quite substantially. I realized from all my learnings and the readings that if I wanted to get beyond where I was, I really need to improve or increase my volume. 20 kilometers a week just wasn't enough to progress. When I looked at elite athletes and elite marathon runners, they were doing five, six, seven times the weekly mileage that I was doing. It's kind of similar to just going to the gym and lifting weights once per week. It's only going to get you so far. So I added a fourth day of running and started to work on increasing the distances of the weekend long run. So now the running looked like this, two easy days per week of about 40 to 60 minutes, one workout run per day, which would take me roughly an hour, and then one long day at the weekend. 
Now up to this point, I was also using a heart rate monitor on my chest. The easy runs were about 130 to 140 beats per minute. That would put me in your typical zone two. And then the long runs, I try to stay around 160, which kept me below something called my lactate threshold. In simple terms, going above that lactate threshold for too long would mean too much metabolic byproduct. Think below the lactate threshold as a free flowing highway where cars are able to move about. And then above the lactate threshold is where there's loads of traffic and there's gridlock and cars just can't move. But then the heart rate monitor broke and it started to malfunction, giving me these weird readings consistently. So I just switched to running paces. I had a good idea of my max 10K effort because I'd been doing a good bit of running by this time. And I got my various paces online through a calculator. There's tons of those online. So this was about five or six months into structured running or essentially five or six months since I got the Garmin. And my VO2 max reading on the watch was around 52 or 53, which put me in the top 10%. At this stage, my nutrition was already good, but I really started to focus on fueling during the sessions. And as a performance nutritionist, I obviously had a huge advantage. Gels became an important part of my running and I worked my way up to consuming about one gel for every 30 minutes of running, which sometimes meant up to three gels in one run. I'd also routinely consume carb powders before and after my sessions, and I supplemented with beta alanine, citrulline malate, and nitrates, which was in the form of beetroot juice. All have been shown to improve endurance. Now I have been a bit inconsistent lately with the first two, so I do need to get back on that and I'll hopefully get my score even higher. Now I did mention that my body weight changed. Across that six month period, I'd say I dropped around nine to 10 pounds, mainly body fat, going from about 207 to 198, which was pretty slow when you think of it. Since then, my body weight is kind of stabled out, especially since I've started to add in more food. And this is the same structure that I've been following since then. So basically the past three months or so, I did try to add in a fifth day, but that was just way too much. So after a week, I brought it back down to four. In a previous video, I talked about how I got to the top 3%, but in fact, since recording that video, I've actually got into the top 1%, which is a VO2 max of 59. Bear in mind that the top 1% of VO2 max is just an average for everybody. Most people who are seasoned endurance athletes are going to have scores even higher than that. And I'm not an elite athlete, by the way. So looking back over that whole period, reflecting on it, I think these are the most important things. Number one, volume and structure of training. Having a plan that progressively focused on getting better and testing myself really, really moved the needle. Number two, treating the sessions like an actual workout. Some of the runs, particularly the workout run that I did, are really, really hard. In fact, they're more difficult than any weightlifting session that I've ever done. You're not gonna get a high VO2 max by simply walking around the block or just doing some steps. You need to be constantly pushing yourself to get better, the same as you do in the gym. And finally, third, fueling my runs appropriately and taking recovery seriously. I basically just applied the same principles of what have given me success in the gym as a bodybuilder to running. Most people just treat cardio as if it's something for fat loss. I treated it like they're actual workouts that need to be fueled properly. You'll notice that I didn't really talk about what zone to do is zone two best or zone five best, because I think it's just way less important than most people think and doing more volume and being consistent is so much more important. Elite alpine skiers, elite swimmers, elite rowers all have high VO2 max scores, but their training is all slightly different. Finding something that you enjoy doing and that you can progress on and be consistent with is the most important thing. And if you can do that soon, you'll be joining me in the top 1% club. If you want more detailed breakdown of how to test and improve your VO2 max, I've created a free mini course, which is linked in the description below. So go check that out. Otherwise I will chat to you soon.